is authorized to declare a recess of the subcommittee at any time. Without objection, members of the full committee not on this subcommittee are authorized to participate in today's hearing. As a reminder, I ask all members to keep themselves muted when they are not being recognized. This will minimize disturbances while members are asking questions of our witnesses. The staff have been instructed not to mute members except where a member is not being recognized and there is an inadvertent background noise. Members are also reminded that they may only participate in one remote proceeding at a time. If you are participating today, please keep your camera on. And if you choose to attend a different remote proceeding, please turn your camera off. If members wish to be recognized during the hearing, please identify yourself by name to facilitate recognition. Just as a reminder, uh, this is, I guess, our third subcommittee hearing. Um, I will be pretty quick on the gavel when the timer has expired. I will, of course, allow witnesses to finish within reason answering questions, but I would ask members that if they go through the four minutes to conclude their remarks and any questions that are at that four minute mark will have to be answered for the record. This hearing is entitled Ending Exploitation, How the Financial System Can Work to Dismantle the Business of Human Trafficking. I now recognize myself for four minutes to give an opening statement. Today's hearing is entitled Ending Exploitation, How the Financial System Can Work to Dismantle the Business of Human Trafficking. Trafficking, and especially human trafficking, is a societal ill that too many think is somebody else's problem. Even in southwestern Connecticut, we see the brutal effects of trafficking, and we are hardly unique in that respect. In 2019, in the United States, Polaris, which operates the U.S. National Human Trafficking Hotline, worked on more than 11,500 situations of human trafficking involving more than 22,000 survivors, more than 4,000 traffickers, and almost 2,000 suspicious businesses. And the most shocking fact is that these numbers are likely only a very small percentage of what's actually going on. The worldwide reach of human trafficking is stunning. There are estimated to be more than 25 million human trafficking victims worldwide, and the business of human trafficking generates more than $150 billion in illegal profits per year. Today's hearing focuses on how we can harness the power of our financial services system to disrupt the business of human trafficking, whether by improving the anti-money laundering statutes or requiring public businesses to look down their supply chain to ensure that they're not benefiting from forced labor, there are a number of areas of improvement that I think this subcommittee should consider. We must ensure that the financial services firms know what to look for to help identify and shut down traffickers and, law, and that law enforcement has the best tools and resources available. We must increase our understanding of the non-traditional means of finance that traffickers are using to avoid our traditional anti-money laundering detection systems. That includes traditional payment alternatives like prepaid credit cards, as well as newer technology like cryptocurrency. We must also pay special attention to the survivors of human trafficking. In the course of their exploitation, some, sur some survivors have their identities stolen by their traffickers who then open accounts in their names to further their criminal enterprise. As these survivors seek to rebuild, they can find themselves in the untenable position of not being able to find shelter or open bank accounts, leaving them at risk of being victimized again. Finally, I take special pleasure in recognizing the extremely important role that nonprofits play in this space. Grace Farms, which is located in my district, has done tremendously important work to combat human trafficking by partnering with law enforcement and other nonprofits. That includes working with renowned experts like Ambassador C. DeBaca, who is with us today, on issues like the use of forced labor in the production of construction materials. With that, I'd like to thank our panel of witnesses whose expertise and experience in their respective fields is unparalleled. I sincerely appreciate your assistance in tackling these difficult issues. The chair now recognizes the distinguished ranking member, my French Hill, for five minutes for an opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for convening this hearing and for the witnesses joining us today for uh, your expertise. A year ago, we began this anti-trafficking initiative when we held our first hearing. The plan was then to have hearings every quarter or so to dive deeper into specific types of trafficking. COVID hit and derailed our well-crafted plan, but I'm pleased that we're resuming our previously scheduled programming today. To that end, I've said I'd like to give these hearings uh, to resume in person, Mr. Chairman. I know you share my view. Given the country is reopening, I think it's imperative for Congress to return to normal operations 
and serve as an example for our nation. Mr. Chairman, a year later, trafficking remains a huge concern for our country. Since I've been in Congress, I've traveled to the southwest border six times to study those critical policy needs. President Biden's recent executive actions that counter the Trump administration's immigration reforms and border measures have increased human trafficking concern. The unaccompanied minors arriving at our southwest border, if they're not already, are potential victims of human trafficking. So far, U.S. Customs and Border Protection has already apprehended 11,000 of these minors in February. According to the CBP, the cartels are making $14 million a day. Let me repeat that, $14 million a day, or $400 million in February alone in trafficking the most vulnerable to our open border. Statistics tell us that 75% of these kids are between the ages of 15 and 17 and highly vulnerable to smugglers and sexual assault. Many end up in debt bondage, working off their illegal crossing fee by forced labor, sex, or both. The Biden administration inherited a secure border, and since eliminating many of the Trump administration decisions, the U.S. has seen a 168% increase in border crossings and apprehensions for unaccompanied minors and 63% for families. Likewise, in Africa's largest country, Nigeria, my concern is growing about the deteriorating human rights situation. And I recently had a call with Dr. Kataza Gond with the Christian Solidarity Worldwide Organization to discuss the intersection of trafficking and terrorism in Africa. And sadly, as we know, human trafficking happens anywhere all over our nation in our backyards. In my home state this past January, 13 people were arrested for a sex trafficking operation in Northeast Arkansas. In this local case, fortunately, due to coordinated and cooperative law enforcement, and I must say well-funded law enforcement, at the local, state, and federal level, three victims were rescued. We need to ensure that we have policies in place to facilitate that kind of synergy and coordinated efforts across jurisdictions and agencies. This is exactly what my good friend Ann Wagner has advocated for during her time in Congress, including her bill, the Homeland Security Investigations Victim Assistance Act, which would help victims of trafficking access the resources they need while also assisting law enforcement in apprehending their traffickers. I'm pleased that she's waved into this hearing today and will lend her knowledge, interest, and expertise. Homeland Security Investigator Special Agent Jerry Miles said it best in that recent Arkansas raid. When we collaborate with local law enforcement and community partners, we increase our reach and our impact. I couldn't agree more with this sentiment. I look forward to the expertise shared today, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Uh, I do share your hope that we can do this in person. I actually did a little due diligence uh, and fa- talking to the attending physician was told that our, our member vaccination rates hovering around 75% probably don't quite get us there. So I'd urge all the members of the subcommittee that share mine and the ranking members uh, uh, hopes that we can get together in person to urge uh, our colleagues to get vaccinated so that we can uh, leave this technology behind. Um, So, moving on today, we uh, welcome the testimony of our distinguished witnesses. Uh, By way of very quick introduction, Ambassador Luis C. DeBaca is a senior fellow in modern slavery and visiting lecturer in law at Yale University here in the state of Connecticut. And he is the former ambassador at large to monitor and combat trafficking in persons. Dr. Luis Shelley, Omar L. and Nancy Hurston Dowd chair at George Mason University. Uh, is the director uh, Terrorism, Transnational Crime and Corruption Center, known as TRAC. Uh, Barry M. Koch, founder and owner of Barry M. Koch PLLC and a commissioner of the Liechtenstein Admin- Initiative. We have Reverend Dr. Marion Hatcher, uh, U.S. Representative for Space International. And finally, uh, we have Layla Micklewait, founder of Tra- Trafficking Hub Movement and president of the Justice Defense Fund. Witnesses, thank you all for being here. You're reminded that your oral testimony will be limited to five minutes. You should be able to see a timer on your screen as our clerk discussed that will indicate how much time you have left and a chime will go off at the end of your time. 
I would ask that you be mindful of the timer and quickly wrap up your testimony if you hear the chime so we can be respectful of both the witnesses and the committee members' time. Without objection, your written statements will be made part of the record. Ambassador Sidabaka, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. And Ambassador, I have to remind you to unmute. Sorry about that. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Hill, members of the committee. Our constitution, laws, and treaty obligations protect people from forced labor, forced prostitution, and the commercial sexual exploitation of children. But millions remain in servitude with a financial impact of at least $150 billion. That is a grave national security threat and a human rights imperative. It's a victim services challenge, and it poses both risks and opportunities for the financial system. Risks because traffickers and profiteers use the financial system to move money, collect payments, and commit other crimes, sometimes even terrorism. So too, lack of access to the financial system leads to self-collateralization. The resulting recruitment fees, transportation costs, and deductions for food and clothing create a peonage situation even before work starts. The abusive company store employer fin based financial system of the past is alive and well. And financial fraud and identity theft by traffickers further victimizes those upon whom they prey. Because the financial system in which this crime is poorly understood exacerbates the victimization through cre credit scoring and other means, just as the lack of understanding has kept survivors out of transitional job opportunities because of criminal records or the inability to meet licensing standards. Initial discussions and preliminary responses have largely been around the retail level and primarily focused on sex trafficking. But the risk is much broader and touches on aspects such as commercial banking and construction financing, as I think my fellow witnesses will address. One note on construction financing, that multi-trillion dollar industry is riddled with forced labor and timber and mining operations often drive demand for sex trafficking. In October, Grace Farms Design for Freedom report identified a number of at-risk building materials in addition to the abuse that we've seen on job sites. A good next step in advancing that effort would be to address construction financing so the trafficking risks are not borne solely by builders, workers, and vulnerable communities. Indeed, financial intelligence around construction material supply chains could bring opportunities for disruption, innovation, and profit. Major financing often comes through the international financial institutions and multilateral development banks, but they have not taken an active role. The U.S. International Development Finance Corporation's project language prohibiting forced labor might be a good model for their activities. There are opportunities, opportunities for partnership. The financial sector can help restore survivors and support service organizations. Banks and consumer credit ratings should aggressively develop credit repair tools. Firms can provide hiring pathways for restoration and partner with service providers and, and survivors to obtain financial intelligence. But none of these things will be possible without leadership from the United States government, which is why there is a need for agency-wide coordination at Treasury to move beyond the admirable but informal engagement and innovation of motiva motivated staff. Imagine secretarial prioritization and trafficking-specific authorities, work responsibilities, and budgets, not to mention relationships with organized labor, human rights groups, service providers, and survivors themselves. So too, clarifying and intensifying human rights sanction authorities and activities would provide a strong tool and ensure harmonization with our allies. Last fall, interagency recommendations were crafted with input from NGOs and survivors. They represented the kind of bipartisan consensus that characterizes this fight. And they include stepped up financial intelligence gathering and dissemination, expansion and intensification of efforts at the Department of Treasury, harnessing the power of the IFIs and the MDBs, creating innovative partnerships and supportive survivors, as well to protect the integrity of the system, facilitating credit repair and restoration, and recognizing the need for mechanisms to protect NGOs and service providers who share important financial information and intelligence. A number of bills that track these recommendations have been introduced or are in discussion stage and would have a real impact. Another worthy prospect in discussion is to build upon the success of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act for trafficking and human rights abuses. Any of these recommended activities and potential laws would add to our ability to investigate and prosecute 
to protect and restore and to prevent this grave human rights crime. Such efforts would facilitate partnerships within the financial system with allied nations and most importantly, the most vulnerable and affected communities. And they would harness the power of the financial system and regulatory bodies alike in service to that most American of ideals, the promise of freedom. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Dr. Shelley, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Thank you, and it's a great honor to be with you today. Human trafficking networks are entrepreneurial and flexible. And as my written testimony reveals, human traffic networks often converge with other illicit activities. In the United States, we have a variety of networks, both domestic and international, and their money is laundered both in the US and abroad. We have networks that are very small, a single trafficker and his facilitators, or as a recent federal case that was um, that produced an indictment in 2018, involved 30,000 clients, 58 cities, and 350,000 online advertisements. This reflects the growth of human trafficking in the online environment, as Leila Mikowait will discuss. I also agree with Ambassador DeBaca that much more needs to be done with labor trafficking, and that often involves corporate act actors, as we see in the fishing, agriculture, and production sector. Human traffickers in documented cases that I uh, mention have used every type of money laundering available. Underground banking, bulk cash smuggling, money laundering into real estate, establishment of allied businesses as vehicles for money laundering, trade-based money laundering, misuse of credit cards, including prepaid credit cards, money transfer businesses, wire transfers, banks, and cryptocurrencies. And in many cases, this illicit activity of human trafficking converges with the legitimate economy. What policies do we need to address human trafficking? First of all, we need to implement and realize the beneficial ownership law that has just been passed, and it needs to be carefully and comprehensively implemented. Traffickers can now hide behind shell companies and anonymous ownership, the largest detected network of human traffickers that I just mentioned involved massage parlors in cities across the US, Canada, and Australia. And the vast majority of massage parlors hide their owner's identity. Therefore, we need to implement the Corporate Transparency Act and establish a national beneficial ownership directory. Two, we need to focus on cryptocurrency which is being used to finance human trafficking and many other forms of illicit activity. Greater financial oversight is needed of this fast growing financial instrument and similarly cooperation in the sharing of information between government agencies and the private sector is needed to track and analyze criminal transactions as I indicate in my statement. Third, we need to follow the money. There needs to be a much more central attention to the role of money in investigations of human trafficking. This is difficult because there are relatively small numbers of suspicious activity reports in the FinCEN database, and they are often not used to full advantage, as was seen in the Epstein case. Training and awareness must be raised in the banking community to not only increase SARS reporting, but also to make use of these reported suspicious transactions that are presently underutilized. Three, we must focus on supply chains for human trafficking by looking at transport systems, travel agencies, hotels, rental apartments, rideshare services, and short-term rental apartments. According to the Human Trafficking Institute's analysis of federal trafficking cases in recent years, over 80% of federal cases of sex trafficking involved exploitation at hotels and motels. Four, we need to enhance regulation and reporting requirements of online businesses to vet customers and report suspicious transactions. 
More needs to be done by companies such as Uber and Airbnb in monitoring data for suspicious patterns of financial transactions and how their businesses inadvertently support human trafficking networks. The role of online businesses in human trafficking is broader than these companies addressed by the foster sesta legislation. And six, we need to address trade-based money laundering. This un under-acknowledged form of money laundering is key to the movement of the proceeds of human trafficking into the global financial system, as many of the loopholes in the rest of the system are shut. Our understanding of TBML requires greater analysis as how it is occurring into human trafficking and the red flags associated with it need to be much more carefully conceived. This will have an enormous impact, not only in countering human trafficking, but other forms of the illicit economy, such as the and fentanyl trade and the environmental crime with which it sometimes intersects. This is also especially relevant to the fishing industry in which large numbers of individuals are subject to labor exploitation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shelley. Uh, Mr. Koch, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Hill and members of the committee. Thank you for the invitation to participate in today's hearing. My name is Barry Koch. I'm a law professor and a private attorney with a consulting practice in which I provide expert witness and advisory services in money laundering cases and financial crimes risk management. I'm also a co-founder of the United States and European Bank Bankers Alliances Against Human Trafficking, a former commissioner on the Financial Sector Commission. And I was one of a team of compliance professionals that developed the first quantitative model in the banking industry to monitor transactional activity for red flags indicative of labor trafficking and sex trafficking. More recently, I was an assistant district attorney here in New York County. I'd like to offer one additional perspective before I offer five concrete recommendations for the committee to consider. Uh, we're all in emphatic agreement about the moral imperative to end human trafficking, but I'd like to offer an, an additional practical reason for increasing our anti-trafficking efforts, which is that trafficking on a macro level is economically inefficient. It depresses innovation, it fuels corruption and the flow of illicit funds in the financial system. It deprives governments of tax revenues and it disrupts the efficient deployment of human capital. It privatizes criminal profits while socializing the costs. So here are my five recommendations for the committee to consider. First, increase the use of financial records and financial data to initiate and strengthen prosecutions. Using financial records and financial data has been effective in identifying victims and perpetrators, improving coercion, which is a required element in a criminal charge, in corroborating witness testimony, and in serving as the basis for asset forfeitures. Further, if witnesses are reluctant to testify because of a threat of violence against them or family members, or the risk of being deported, or even because of the fear of being prosecuted themselves, financial records can be used to pursue other serious criminal charges that may not require testimony. For example, prosecutors may bring a case against a trafficker for tax evasion, structuring, and money laundering, where the trafficker's tax returns report minimal income and assets, yet the financial records refute those tax returns by illustrating a lavish lifestyle. Serious crimes that may be related to the trafficking, such as bank fraud, kidnapping, extortion, identity theft, and immigration fraud can also form the basis for asset forfeiture, which is a very powerful tool to disrupt a trafficking business. Second, strengthen the use of sanctioned regimes. There is already a precedent for the U.S. to use economic sanctions to designate and punish human rights violators and to deny them access to the U.S. financial system. Executive orders have in the past identified serious and flagrant human rights abuses as threats to the national security, foreign policy, and the economy of the United States. And in this context, the government has previously sanctioned transnational criminal organizations 
companies and individuals for migrant smuggling, human trafficking, and child prostitution. These sanctions can be designed to be limited and surgical and can be used to target industries that are notorious for using child labor and trafficked labor in their supply chains. In evaluating this recommendation, it is important to note that the U.S. financial sector already has a well-developed operational infrastructure to ensure immediate and sustainable compliance. Three, strengthen the risk assessment process employed by financial institutions as a critical element of their anti-money laundering programs. There are material weaknesses in the current regulatory and operational framework, and here are a few practical ways to address them. Require that the risk of human trafficking be specifically included in annual anti-money laundering risk assessments. Very few large banks do this. Virtually none of the midsize and small banks or credit unions or money transmitters and check cashers include the risk of human trafficking as part of their annual AML risk assessment. Second, require financial institutions to evaluate human trafficking as a funding source for terrorist organizations. Although the current regulatory scheme treats human trafficking as a reportable predicate crime for money laundering, few, if any, financial institutions do that. Many national governments, including our own, have overlooked this issue, focusing only on the money laundering risks. And there are published cases that report instances where the Islamic State has conducted online slave auctions in territories that it controlled. And more recently, in fact, we saw it just in yesterday's Wall Street Journal, cases involving Boko Haram, there are multiple kidnappings of school children, some of whom are ransomed, while others are forced into marrying their captors, while still others are conscripted into serving as child soldiers. I'm aware of the time, so I will simply refer uh, the members to my written statement, which goes into additional uh, recommendations, including how to address the cryptocurrency risks and how to take a more victim-centric approach uh, uh, to uh, helping traffickers um, uh, who are caught up in the criminal justice system. Thank you. Th thank you, Mr. Koch. Uh, Re Reverend Dr. Hatcher, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> Greetings, Chair, Chairman, Ranking Member, Representative from Illinois, and this esteemed body. It is an honor and a privilege to share my personal and professional experience and knowledge in an area which adversely impacts citizens of this great country every day. Human trafficking relies on a business model which feeds on the vulnerable, benefiting only the predatory. It results in violence, substandard living conditions, loss of hope, and loss of life. Growing up, I had a loving and caring family. However, molestation by a relative at age seven forever changed the tra trajectory of my life. While I went on to achieve formal education, corporate success, marriages, motherhood, the trauma of that molestation would awaken under negative circumstances. Those circumstances included a volatile combination of domestic violence, drugs, and associated trauma. I was guilt-ridden and ashamed by allowing my first abuser, but not the last, to hurt me, assault my mother, put a gun to the head of my oldest son, and terrorize my older children. When I ran from the danger at home, I embraced the numbness provided by crack cocaine and alcohol. To feed that habit, prostitution became a way of life. Eventually, I was trafficked. Soon, it became impossible to imagine returning to my loved ones who I abandoned. My tribe parents, ex-husband, aunts, and other in-laws to care of my children and each other until God brought me home. My exploitation eventually led to my arrest, not an uncommon outcome for so many trafficking survivors. However, I benefited from jail-based treatment, and even though arrest should never be a tool for connecting survivors with services, having access to those services paved the way to reuniting me with my family after nearly two years, and I found a second chance. My second chance resulted in a career purpose-filled next chapter at Cook County, Illinois Sheriff's Office, where I progressed through several roles and most recently served as policy analyst and victim advocate. Currently, and I am on medical leave due to progressive multiple sclerosis. 
In 2005 to 2019, my purpose and responsibility became addressing the unaddressed issues of victims who lived, suffered, and often died because of experiences like mine. Seeing how many people, especially women of color, were ruined by systems of prostitution and systemic oppression planted in me a fiery passion and a focus on gender-based violence. This dedication was surpassed only by my commitment to hold predators accountable. I am here to present my lived experience, <clears throat> both as a victim of human trafficking and as a professional champion of law enforcement tactics that center restorative justice and accountability. I am not speaking in any official capacity. Instead, I am here as a result of my lived and professional expertise, which informs this issue in several roles, including as a U.S. representative for Space International, which means survivors of prostitution, <clears throat> excuse me, prostitution abuse calling for enlightenment. We represent 10 countries as a member of Shared Hope International's Just Response Council and as a policy consultant in the National Center on Sexual Exploitation and Demand Abolition. Based on my experience interview, interviewing hundreds of victims and watching scores of federal, state, and local trafficking cases unfold, I want to share three high-level observations regarding the, the business model of human trafficking. My written testimony provides a more detailed assessment of these issues. First, the commercial sex trade is a billion-dollar industry, as we stated, that causes massive long-term physical and psychological damage, disproportionately impacting women and youth of color. Yet almost no money reaches victims, even those even though those identified as victims of human even those identified as human trafficking. The need of the need for expanded services for trafficking victims is great, and the lack of investment in services can be addressed in part by redirecting funds from convicted exploiters in order to help fund specialized programs that can address, <clears throat> excuse me, persistent scarcity of appropriate services. Second, technology can be a tool for investigation and prosecution by following the money, which also reduces reliance on the testimony of victims who face a host of potentially re-traumatizing experiences in the criminal justice process. Using technology to follow the money is what King County Seattle did in its investigation and prosecution of the review board, a website set up by sex buyers to promote access to prostituted individuals. By focusing enforcement efforts on the market driver, <clears throat> the sex buyers rather than the individuals being bought and sold on the website, they are able to dramatically impact the market for exploitation in their jurisdiction. Third, despite the current popularity of the mantra, quote unquote, sex work is work, my 15 years of experience also tells me that most women and youth do not want to be, so, be selling access to their bodies. Even those who are not trafficked are selling out of duress, such as addiction, homelessness, mental duress, or a combination of these factors. Most want out of the life. Most encounter major obstacles to achieving financial stability, including barriers of accessing basic banking services such as bank accounts and credit cards. The resulting lack of resources often leads to re-exploitation as survivors feel they have no option other than returning to the commercial sex industry. I want to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to answering your questions about these critically important issues. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Reverend Hatcher. Um, uh, for that testimony. Uh, Ms. Micklewaite, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Thank you very much. Uh, prior to this year, Pornhub was the 10th most trafficked website in the world with 42 billion visits per year. The site boasted 6.8 million videos uploaded per year that would take 169 years to watch. Pornhub is owned by MindGeek, an international pornography conglomerate that has obtained a monopoly on the porn industry. As the New York Times put it, MindGeek is a porn titan. MindGeek is also what I call a mega sex trafficker in that its sites are infested with highly monetized commercial crime scene footage of user-generated child sexual abuse, rape, assault, and other forms of non-consensual pornographic content. Every video on Pornhub is commercial. In fact, the totality of videos on the MindGeek sites generate hundreds of millions of dollars per year. The company knowingly has enabled and profited from mass amounts of filmed sex acts induced by force, fraud, or coercion, and the commercial sexual abuse of children. Unfortunately, Pornhub is not alone. 
There is an entire big porn industry operating similar user generated porn tube sites. For example, MindGeek's biggest rival, WDCZ, who has had a recent class action lawsuit filed against it on behalf of trafficked minors, boasts 200 million daily visitors and 6 billion daily ad impressions on its sites. Like Pornhub, these websites are set up for exploitation, allowing any user with a cell phone camera to anonymously upload sex acts with only an email address. This lack of oversight and accountability is intentional on the part of these sites because the unlimited ability to upload content by any user in the world is the business model that generates the most profit. For Pornhub and its largest competitors, content is king. The more content that is uploaded, the more traffic is driven to the site, and the more profit is generated from advertising, premium memberships, and the sale of user data. In fact, 50% of Pornhub's profit is generated via advertising. Because profits are the crux of the issue, financial services actors that facilitate and benefit from the exchange of money play a crucial role when it comes to enabling or disabling the crime of sex trafficking on such sites. For example, after 2 million people from 192 countries had signed the petition to hold Pornhub accountable, over 300 organizations called for the site to be shut down, victims publicly came forward, lawmakers in the U.S. and abroad called for criminal investigations, grassroots protests were being organized around the world, and hundreds of media articles were bringing attention to the sexual crime on the site, Pornhub still refused to acknowledge the problem. Even until October 2020, Pornhub told the media that suggestions that children were being exploited on the site were conspiracy theories. However, in December, a groundbreaking New York Times expose put pressure on the major card companies to stop enabling the abuse. MasterCard, Visa, and Discover quickly responded by confirming illegal content on the site, disabling the use of their cards, and in under 24 hours, the 10th most trafficked website in the world deleted 80% of its content, totaling 10 million videos. Not only was this a dramatic admission of guilt on the part of Pornhub, but it was also a demonstration of the power and influence that financial institutions have in regulating even the largest websites in the world. This leverage should have been utilized a long time before it was, not only because it was the right thing to do, but because knowing that trafficking was being facilitated with their services and not taking action is illegal. According to the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, knowingly benefiting from a trafficking venture is prohibited. So what are the solutions? First, we urgently need the antiquated law USC 2257 to be amended to hold websites distributing user-generated pornography responsible for age verification and record keeping. This law has been in place for decades to help prevent child abuse from proliferating in the porn industry, but it must be updated to keep up with the times and hold the major online porn distributors accountable for the content that they profit from. Second, we need mandatory reliable reliable age and consent verification procedures mandated for every sex act uploaded online. Reintroducing and passing the bipartisan Stop Internet Sexual Exploitation Act should be a priority. Laws regarding the disclosure of beneficial owners of companies who owned such sites is also an, an important accountability measure. In the case of MindGeek, its executives and owners have intentionally hidden their identities in order to escape scrutiny. Even now, we don't know who is ultimately behind the company. Lastly, enforcement of laws concerning the mandatory reporting of child sexual abuse material must be improved to ensure that companies like MindGeek, which has offices, servers, and substantial consumers in the United States, are held accountable for failing to report known CSAM as legally required. Recent testimony and publicly available data show that despite widespread presence of child exploitation on Pornhub, the company made no reports to Canadian or American authorities for over a decade. This is unacceptable. We need accountability. These actions would go a long way in the realm of sex trafficking prevention in the digital age. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Ms. Mickelwaite, and thank you all to all of our witnesses for your powerful and valuable testimony. Um, I now recognize myself for five minutes of questions. Um, and Ambassador Sidebach, I'd like to start with you. Both you and Dr. Shelley mentioned supply chains. The Congress is spending a lot of time thinking about supply chains in the context of cybersecurity. I wonder if you could give us some guidance, uh, and since Dr. Shelley, you mentioned it too, I'll turn to you next. 
what actually should the Congress be doing with respect to either mandating, requiring, encouraging, asking for disclosure that would improve uh, the visibility into, into supply chains? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that one of the uh, most important things is to remove the, um, the current situation in which most companies who are looking at their supply chains are either already good actors um, or are doing it on a wholly voluntary um, basis that they can then uh, back off of as convenient. Um, and we saw that just in the last 24 hours uh, with Intex, uh, the um, parent company of Zara, who has evidently taken their zero tolerance for forced labor policy off of their website due to Chinese pressure um, over the Uyghur situation. Um, and so I think that that uh, tells us right there uh, that even in something that's been uh, as well documented, even in something that's been as well organized as the cotton campaign uh, and the garment uh, work over the last decade, um, if it's left to companies to do voluntarily, um, they will do it when convenient or they will um, do it uh, through greenwashing uh, and ineffective multi-stakeholder initiatives. And so I think that we need to, just as what we've seen with the, the uh, United Kingdom's uh, mandatory disclosures uh, and uh, the Australian Modern Slavery Act that followed it, building on uh, the example of the California Supply Chain Transparency Act, um, I think it's time for a, a United States Supply Chain Transparency Act at the national level, uh, which does not make disclosure um, or doing work in your supply chain um, at all voluntary on the part of firms. Uh, there's a lot that one can do by looking at uh, the federal procurement regulations, uh, which again, a bipartisan uh, response from both the Obama and Trump administrations. Uh, President Trump uh, and his folks took the Obama executive order and, and helped to put teeth into it. Uh, and I think it just shows that this is a consensus issue uh, that we can come together. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Dr. Shelley, let me ask you to chime in if you'd like to. I do have one remaining question for, for uh, Mr. Potch, though, so let me ask you to be uh, brief, if you would. Certainly. I, would, I certainly endorse what Ambassador DeBaca says about supply chain transparency and how we need that on the, on the national level and not just California, but I think there also needs to be much more of an enforcement mechanism and not just voluntary declarations because it hasn't been as effective as needed. I've been working for the last two years on um, an NSF grant looking at illicit supply chains in regards to human trafficking. And what is evident from this research is that many of the key nodes intersect with the legitimate economy. So as we're looking at and was just talked about was online activity and advertisements. So that intersects with, with the internet. Then we have transport of victims, which often occurs through commercial vehicles or often with ride sharing. And then the victims of who are, who are exploited by the traffickers are taken often to hotels and motels that takes them and places them in another commercial environment, which is a legitimate part of our economy. So what we need to be doing is focusing much more on the intersection of this illicit phenomenon that is resulting um, with so much tragedy on how it is being facilitated and supported by legitimate and large-scale companies in the United States, because many of the hotels are large chains, and they have, until there started to be suits from victims, not paid enough attention to what was going on in their hotels and establishing policies. So this is not something that is existing totally in the illicit and dark economy. Thank, thank you, Dr. Shelley. Uh, uh, Mr. Koch, I, was, I, 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 don't, I only have nine seconds left, so I'm going to ask you to answer this question in written form. I'm very interested to know whether there's alternative financial information that our current anti-money laundering efforts don't capture that would be valuable in this effort. Uh, again, I'm out of time, so I can't, I can't ask you to answer, but uh, I would also invite the other witnesses if they have thoughts about data that we might capture that would be helpful uh, to uh, also respond subsequent to this hearing. 
Um, with that, uh, I uh, recognize the distinguished ranking member for five minutes of questions. Well, thank you, Chairman. And again, thanks for the uh, hearing and what an excellent panel. Uh, everybody on our committee is learning a great deal and we appreciate the heartfelt, detailed and recommended uh, ideas in your testimony. You know, Speaker Pelosi, whenever she gives an interview, she always makes a statement for her that uh, is summarized, I'm gonna paraphrase, it's always for her, she says She's about the that. children. And so this is certainly a major challenge when it thinks about human trafficking, both on the border, domestically, and in other countries as a part of the transnational crime movement. I know this is a desponding topic for so many. And uh, as Speaker Pelosi uh, often mentions, it's always about the children. I hope that we on this committee uh, think about that, that it is in fact often about uh, our youngest, most vulnerable people. I mentioned my opening statement about the encounters on the border, 100,000 alone uh, in February, uh, up uh, the highest in seven years. One report I read, the highest uh, I read, said in the highest in 15 years. So this is a key challenge for us right now in the country. It's definitely a crisis. Jay Johnson, who as our former secretary in charge of Homeland Security under President Obama said that anytime there were more than a thousand encounters a day, uh, it was a bad number. So I hope that puts in perspective the challenge that we have. Uh, Ambassador Sidovaki, when unaccompanied minor uh, crosses the border into the United States, tell us how Health and Human Services and other agencies are responsible for the child screening uh, potential sponsors to ensure a child is not uh, put into a harmful situation or a trafficking situation here in our country. So my understanding, um, and <clears throat> as a former uh, federal prosecutor, more of my uh, direct uh, responsibility was on investigating prosecuting cases, uh, but my understanding as to what HHS does with unaccompanied alien children um, is that uh, within uh, a short time frame, I think 48 hours, um, they are tasked with identifying sponsors, preferably family members, um, who the children can then go ahead and travel to join. Um, there was a consensus in the 2008 Trafficking Victims Protection Act reauthorization um, that the prior practice of uh, releasing the unaccompanied alien minors back across the border um, was simply creating a revolving door and was creating an awful lot of uh, sexual assault uh, and other mistreatment on the other side of the Mexican Thank you. border. Thank you very much. Um, I agree. I think it's a huge challenge. And right now, uh, the unaccompanied, those held in unaccompanied uh, conditions, 70% uh, are not being met any kind of resolution within 72 hours. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to insert in the record a uh, study that was released by the Senate uh, Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations on Protecting Unaccompanied Alien Children from Trafficking and Other Abuses. I'd like to submit that for the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you very much. Um, in talking to my friend Melissa Dawson today, she runs the Centers for Youth and Family here in Arkansas. They do an outstanding job helping our kids that are victims of trafficking here in the state. I visited that process and I admire her so much. Uh, she talks about um, the issue of technology using more and more uh, about uh, increasing trafficking. And she also talks about her concern that she can't get cases, see cases prosecuted because they're complex around uh, uh, to track the transactions. And she's concerned about uh, Bitcoin and cash apps so, uh, Mr. Koch, uh, is there a way that cash apps and other currencies such as Bitcoin transactions could be monitored more effectively for suspicious activity? Yes, absolutely. And uh, I, again, would refer the, the committee to my written statement where I address this, but let me explain the context in which I address it because it's a very important question. It's the context of public-private partnerships. Uh, which the Congress did cover in the Anti-Money Laundering Act of 2020. Uh, there are some uh, not-for-profit startups 
and there are other uh, companies that are doing some brilliant uh, cutting edge work in looking at a cryptocurrency analysis, uh, in looking at uh, the dark web uh, for specifically this purpose. And they are sharing the information with law enforcement and with the financial sector. And this information provides uh, actionable intelligence for investigations. Uh, more should be done, but the public-private partnership theme, which I know your subcommittee is concerned with as well, is one very effective way uh, to go in that direction. Thank you for that. I'll have some additional questions for the record, and Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Gottheimer, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Himes and Ranking Member Hill for calling this very important hearing today and to all of our witnesses for being here. Many of the same online tools that we all use to keep in touch with loved ones or conduct business during this pandemic, as we all know, are increasingly being utilized by those who wish to do harm to our nation. This harm is not limited solely to the spread of extremist hate and propaganda by groups like Hamas and Proud Boys, but also encompasses illicit activities such as groups that utilize social media to advertise or recruit potential human trafficking victims. And this to me is unacceptable. Tech companies and social media platforms should be doing everything they can to stop the proliferation of harmful content. Uh, Ms. McElroy, uh, we see time and again as websites drag their feet to remove illicit content and fail to report it to the authorities. Should tech companies be held to a higher liability standard when it comes to allowing this material to stay online? And what role could the financial service industry play to help stop illicit actors from profiting from the content generated by human trafficking? Thank you for that question. I think what's important here is to highlight the harm that these, um, you know, recorded crime scene uh, videos do to these victims. You know, it's one thing for a victim to be subject to rape, to be subject to trafficking. Um, but what I've heard from countless victims who, who have I've spoken with about their abuse online is that it's the immortalization of their trauma. They call it that um, because uh, they go on with the knowledge that their abuse, that their trauma, the worst moments of their life will live on in the digital space long after they're gone. And they live with that terrorizing knowledge. And so I think that there's this high, high level of uh, responsibility uh, for sites like Pornhub, like MindGeek owned sites, like X videos, X hamster, others that are distributing sex acts. Um, often containing minors, containing trafficked women, containing those who have not given their consent to be uh, uploaded and distributed online. And I think that we must hold them accountable. We need to see age and consent verification when a sex act is uploaded online. I think that would go a long way in the area of prevention, um, like I mentioned. Do you think the tech companies should be held to a, a higher liability though in general? Should they be held more responsible for this? Um, I mean, I think that they should be held responsible as, as as any company that would knowingly benefit from a trafficking venture, would knowingly benefit from the distribution of child sexual abuse material. Um, you know, we have those laws in place, and I think that they need to be applied. Thank you. Uh, if I turn to the ambassador now, do you believe that the current financial intelligence system we have in place is effective in providing the proper data to law enforcement to track and combat human trafficking through the financial system? I do not. Um, and, you know, I think that one of the things that we've seen is that it's been slow uptake of the uh, SARS checkbox that has been added. Uh, it took a lot of staff work and it took a lot of, of dedicated uh, folks to in both the banking industry and over at Treasury to get that done. Uh, but it really needs, I think, to get disseminated out uh, to the banks uh, and then uh, back in uh, at the Department of Justice and in the U.S. Attorney's offices. The folks over in asset forfeiture and, and money laundering section uh, working uh, more closely with the folks over in the criminal section of the civil rights division so that we can incorporate in following the money and, and just to follow up on that ambassador how do you think we should be should there be uh credit i have a coordinator or treasury working with the secretary how, how would you provide this agency-wide coordination to stop uh, help stop human trafficking what's the what do you what steps should we take specifically well, you know, one of the things that we um, saw during uh, my time as, as the coordinator for the U.S. government was that when a secretary's office brought the anti-trafficking fight into the highest uh, level of the agency, uh, things started getting done. 
Uh, we saw that at transportation, we saw it at education, we even saw it at USDA. And so I think that uh, it would be a salutary thing uh, for Department of Treasury uh, to take that move as well. Thank you. And it's something I'm going to be working closely with Treasury on to make sure that we're using all of our uh, coordination and and to stand up to the social media websites and cryptocurrencies and stay one one step ahead here, uh, which I think is key. And uh, we'll continue to work together to make sure that happens so that we're well coordinated in our arsenal to combat this threat. So um, thank you again for to our witnesses and for time today. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Williams, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Ranking Member. Regardless of whether my Democratic colleagues want to uh, recognize what everyone else can see in plain sight is that there is a crisis at our southern border. They were over 100,000 100, illegal immigrants detained in the month of February alone, and a large number of these were children and family units coming across our border. I'm extremely concerned that as our border patrol agents are being overwhelmed by all these people, is making it easier for human traffickers to slip through the cracks and expand this horrible practice in this country. Governor Greg Abbott from my great state of Texas summed up the issue well in a letter he sent to the Biden administration earlier this week about what we are seeing on the ground. He wrote, recent decisions by your administration in emboldening dangerous cartels, smugglers and human traffickers to ramp up their criminal operations. In many cases, these criminals entice unaccompanied minors into inhumane conditions and expose them to abuse and terror. So I, along with many of my fellow Texans, share the exact concerns of our governor. So Ambassador DeBaca, what additional steps should HHS be uh, taking to ensure children apprehended at the border are not being trafficked? Well, I think there's a, a, a couple of things. Um, first of all, I think it's not just HHS, but um, DHS itself, as you said, um, and I think um, putting all of the onus on our Border Patrol personnel um, takes one of the most important tools out of the tool chest, and that's the folks over at HSI, Homeland Security Investigations. Um, what we know about human trafficking is that it doesn't uh, manifest itself in transit. Um, it's something that typically is only known once people have gotten to their destination and are put into forced labor or sex trafficking. And so we're talking about a interior enforcement priority that HSI, I think, uh, is good at, but always lacks the efforts, uh, the, um, the money, the budget, the agents, et cetera. So I think the kind of things that we heard from uh, Ranking Member Hill uh, about the situation up in uh, Arkansas with the uh, HSI agents being able to work hand in glove with their local counterparts, I think that's gonna be really important. Um, as far as the HHS uh, is concerned, um, there's good leadership over there in the in the counter trafficking office, um, and I think that um, the procedures, as I understand it, are being uh, worked on. I'm not part of the, that effort, um, but I would say that typically uh, one wants to uh, have as much information as possible about the families uh, and placements that those children are traveling to join. Okay, thank you. Uh, I do have another. I do have other questions, but before I move on, I just need to. Uh, reiterate one more time, we must have a serious problem at our southern border. And we so far, we have not seen the leadership that is needed out of the White House to get the situation under control. So, Mr. Koch, we have been told that the current CTR and SAR thresholds are so low that it makes uh, finding bad actors extremely difficult. We've heard it uh, described as trying to find a needle in a haystack. And since there's so much information to sift through, uh, how can we make the use of these suspicious transaction reports more useful for law enforcement? It should, it should be part, excuse me, it should be part of a larger approach within the financial industry to deny the traffickers access to the system. Much of what has been discussed over the past uh, few minutes has been reactive, and that's not bad, but it's different from preventive. Uh, and what is missing from the regulatory uh, environment uh, is that the uh, global banking system is not doing risk assessments for uh, traffic labor in supply chains of their corporate customers. And that is a gaping hole 
it is probably much larger than the SARS that talk about credit card fraud and identity theft and the CTRs that report $11,000 in currency transactions. So I think you have to combine the two. But as far as the actual thresholds, uh, my view is that the CTR threshold is the correct threshold. And I would take uh, guidance from law enforcement there uh, on changing the number. It's been discussed many times over the years, and they have consistently said, don't change the number. I would take the same view with the SARS. It's not the number that matters. It's the narrative and the sophistication of the transactional analysis uh, that I would focus on. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I yield my time back. The gentleman yields the gentleman from New York, Mr. Torres, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The 115th Congress, uh, for the first time ever, established an exception to Section 230. Uh, the exception allows tech companies to be held civilly liable for sexually exploitive content. Um, I have a question for Ms. Um, Micklewake. So, to what extent has the law been effective at diminishing the online market for sexually exploitive content? Because I gather from your testimony that online platforms remain widespread facilitators of sex trafficking, even with the threat of civil liability. Well, uh, one thing that we're seeing now is the utilization of that law. You know, with, with regard to MindGeek, this specific case, um, you know, since December, there have been uh, multiple lawsuits uh, launched against the company, filed against the company, utilizing that carve out. Um, and so I, we are seeing, you know, two uh, class action lawsuits on behalf of trafficked minors, one filed in California, another filed in Alabama. Um, we also have a, a filing of 40 women who were trafficked on Pornhub who are also utilizing that law. Um, and, and so, yeah, we are seeing that this was an important uh, accountability measure and that it is be, being utilized. And so I think it's, it's, it, it, is, um, it is a positive thing. And you rightly pointed out that the Christoph expose uh, demonstrates that public scrutiny can create a powerful incentive for companies to do the right thing. Is there a role for the federal government to play in monitoring websites for sexually exploitive content and calling out companies that continue to facilitate sex trafficking? I believe that there is a role for the government to play in accountability uh, for these sites. Um, you know, my recommendations are not just for monitoring, but really, um, you know, the enforcement of laws, uh, the updating of laws that we have already on the books. For example, I mentioned USC 2257, and this was a law that was uh, adopted decades ago, uh, you know, and, and the problem with the law is that it's antiquated, it's old. It was implemented to prevent child sexual abuse uh, rape and trafficking in the pornography industry back when DVDs and VHS tapes and magazines were the primary distribution method for this content. And it needs to be updated. And I think that that would go um, a long way in helping to prevent uh, child exploitation and trafficking on these big porn sites. Um, but also, like I mentioned, the S uh, Stop Internet Sexual Exploitation Act, which uh, focuses on age verification and consent verification uh, for sex acts that are being uploaded online. I think, again, that is a, a very, very critical and important uh, priority that we must focus on to help prevent the uh, you know, distribution of this kind of content um, in the digital age. And you made a powerful point about the immortalization of trauma. And I'm wondering, how, how, do, how do we pre best prevent that? Should porn sites be more like YouTube, which does not allow for downloading? How, how do we best prevent the immortalization of trauma, as you described earlier? Well, first, I want to point out that up until the New York Times piece uh, pointed out that there was this download button on every single video. And think about that, you know, 7 million videos uploaded per year, like I said, 169 years to this content and the the company designed the site in such a way that they enabled a download button on every single video even though they were not verifying age and consent for upload and we have uh, records that show that they only had 10 under 10 uh, moderators per shift 
monitoring this content on the site. And so this is a, a kind of a business model. This is the way that this these sites are set up is to have this unlimited uh, ability to upload again because content is king because traffic is what drives profits. Um, and so I think that, you know, obviously we need to uh, disable the ability for those downloads. But even if you disable the ability for downloads, I mean, people in, in this day and age can screen record anything online and then they can redistribute it again and again and again and again, and again uh, for the rest of all time once uh, you know this gets out of control once it's uploaded initially onto any of these sites and so I think the preventative measure before upload things uh, you know these these uh, sex acts need to be uh, vetted there needs to be accountability before upload before these acts get onto these sites we need that kind of preventative uh, uh, measures in place and then I have a quick question for the ambassador we all know uh, China's role in the labor trafficking of Uyghur Muslims. Are there any other nation states, any particularly egregious actors that are known to aid and abet uh, human trafficking? And have we imposed sanctions on those countries? And that, that will be my final question for the ambassador. Excuse me. Uh, yes, there are um, both in state-sponsored forced labor, such as the um, North Korean labor export scheme uh, which sends enslaved North Koreans uh, into um, other countries, especially in uh, industrial and manufacturing. Um, but we've also seen sanctions on countries um, for mistreatment of uh, trafficking victims, uh, such as Iran uh, and others. Um, I think one of the things that as we're looking at- Ambassador, I'm sorry, the gentleman's, tag, uh, the gentleman's time has expired. I need you to wrap it up quickly. Yes, um, cotton is not simply a, a Uyghur problem. It also is a problem in the former Soviet Central Asian republics. If, if you'd like to uh, embroider on that answer, you can do so for the record. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Davidson, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, thanks to uh, our ranking member. Thanks to uh, our witnesses. And just to appreciate uh, that we're having this hearing on an important topic. Uh, I want to also thank my colleague, uh, Ann Wagner, who's really done a lot of work on this in my uh, time on the committee now and uh, time in Congress. Uh, it's been uh, rewarding to be part of co-sponsoring some of the bills she's worked on over time. So uh, thanks for the work that you all are devoting to really ending this practice, uh, you know, or at least making the people that participate in it accountable. Uh, it's a black market practice in the United States, uh, sex trafficking, human trafficking. Um, and we have a very large black market, you know. Um, Ambassador uh, Sidabaka, I wanted to uh, take a chance to look who who what's the makeup of the demand component of this how do we you talked about interior enforcement when congressman williams was talking about it how do we get after the demand what is the profile of the demand and how how do we focus on that yeah you know i think that one of the things that we see is there's uh, two types of demand there's uh, demand for um, commercial sex and demand for uh, cheaply made goods that are kind of derivative demand that traffickers then uh, use enslavement and abuse to meet. And then there's the other demand, uh, the even more pernicious demand, which is specific to um, child commercial sexual exploitation, um, almost a, a pedophilic demand uh, for um, images or um, sexual contact uh, with minors. And I think we have to address both of those demands uh, if we only focus on the most heinous, um, I think that we are uh, allowing uh, these industries to flourish uh, in those cracks. Um, I, I want to focus on where this happens. I mean, I guess I'm wondering, are, are uh, immigrants and minorities more exploited as victims of uh, human trafficking? Uh, does that seem to fit the profile of the supply chain? Well, this week in my class at Yale, we're just getting to the 1970s, um, and that's kind of the pivot point. Um, when uh, the African-American community uh, stops being the dominant uh, group uh, in which uh, enslavement, uh, modern slavery um, is happening in the, the domestic service or agricultural farm work. Um, in both of those sectors, we've seen a replacement um, of that uh, previously excluded and vulnerable community uh, by a predominantly immigrant uh, community. In sex trafficking, I think we still see uh, folks from the minority communities, um, and I think most troubling, uh, the indigenous community 
um, the tribes are seeing an awful lot of problems uh, that are tied into a number of the other social ills uh, that plague the, the tribes. Thank you for that. And I think it just highlights how important it is, the interconnectedness here uh, with fixing our broken immigration system. It, it creates a massive black market. The people are exploited on it uh, tremendously. Uh, and, you know, we, we, we are a welcoming country for people that do it legally, but the broken nature of the legal system in the United States, coupled with the massive appeal of our country as a true land of opportunity, uh, create a big desire to be here uh, even if it means being here illegally. And uh, I think the interior enforcement uh, shouldn't be looked at as hostile. It should be looked at as compassionate. We have to end these practices. We have to secure our border as a component of national security. And it's a component to end human suffering and exploitation, or at least diminish it here in the United States. I think one of the areas that we should look at, and it's noticed in this bill, it's not so much a focus here on the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, we, we talked, um, you know, Congressman Torres talked about uh, Uyghurs and Uyghur exploitation in China. And as a component of our foreign policy, I think it's, you know, you know been a great legacy for the United States to deal with human rights. Uh, and China is clearly abusing uh, their Uyghur population uh, in virtually every way that you could imagine. And so I think that the bill that we noticed talking about trying to how to turn the SEC into sort of a, a law enforcement mechanism for uh, other good causes uh, is, is wrongheaded. We should look at sanctions, and I'd love to work with uh, Congressman Torres on that and others in the committee, because stronger things with the tools that we already have uh, using OFAC would be more useful uh, than trying to go passively and just go after publicly traded companies in their supply chains. Uh, so thanks for the work. Uh, I look forward to collaboration with members of the committee and with uh, some of our witnesses if you have ideas. So um, with that, I'll yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentlewoman from Pennsylvania, Ms. Dean, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for uh, bringing together such a, an amazing panel of experts. Uh, I want to ask a couple of quick questions to get more from you than from me. Uh, Reverend Dr. Hatcher, um, how can we more effectively support survivors of human trafficking, uh, both their physical and mental health, but also their financial well-being? That's a, a great question. <clears throat> First of all, we need to uh, turn the pain into purpose and the exploitation into economic empowerment. Those two uh, together give survivors a chance. There, there's that lack of hope. Um, I mean, if you have no hope, you know, there's, there's no chance at trying to become a uh, productive member of society. And we're talking about um, lives who are uh, utilized for uh, constant uh, pounding and sexual activity that numbs them to what's really going on in the world, what really is good about being alive and being a human being and being a person that is able to contribute to, uh, you know, the, the world and, you know, to to you know, have an enriched way of looking at things, to have dignity and respect, and so, you know, the the most important thing is to get uh, victims uh, and survivors to a point where they want to live, where they want to be a part of society, where they feel they can contribute to society. Um, there's one of the the biggest problems, Representative uh, uh, Dean is. The for for me, you know, I was blessed to be in a environment at the Cook County Sheriff's Office that believed in rehabilitation. Um, you know, the domestic violence sent me to that really awful place. I was missing for two years, you know, but I ended up in in this safe place. It happened to be jail, but this safe place that gave me services. Okay, then my 17 years in the corporate sector, you know, brought that together. That's a new Marion. But most of, I'm not the, the normal profile when it comes down to uh, prostituted and exploited individuals. Most of them have not had an opportunity to be a uh, contributing member of society before, to be able to know that there are, uh, you know, there are norms that don't include their body being sold to meet their basic needs. And so we need to make sure that there is no long-term impact like criminalization. For me, 
if it weren't for the fact that I was in a forward thinking uh, environment and was hired with a felony conviction that was not till 13 years later, granted executive clemency by Governor Rauner. You know, think about that. That's a, you know, the sheriff's office is like, we believe in rehabilitation. It's okay. We know that you ha have things to contribute. And so we have to not criminalize survivors. We have to, where when they are criminalized, provide vacature opportunities. And, you know, from, from the very beginning, there has to be um, a plan. There has to be a plan to provide, meet that person where they're at, walk side by side with them to know exactly what they need. And it takes a team. It takes a multidisciplinary team. I thank you, and I apologize. You, I could listen to you give us more information. I'm sorry. Many, many <laughs> minutes. I want to try to get one other question in that sort of follows, uh, but thank you for what you just said and what you highlighted. Somewhat follows what Mr. Himes was asking uh, when his time stopped. Um, uh, Mr. Koch, uh, in your testimony, one of your recommendations is for financial institutions to require the risk of human trafficking to be included on the annual money laundering assessments, which something currently few do. Uh, what would that assessment look like? Can you explain how it would benefit and ultimately reduce uh, trafficking? Sure. So the benefit uh, and the benefit would be that it would uh, uh, keep uh, trafficking out of that institution. It would make it more difficult for large projects uh, and large corporations that have trafficked labor and child labor in their supply chains to access financial products. Um, what it would look like, there's actually a model, it's an interactive model that's in my uh, written statement uh, that we won't have time to go through today. Uh, but what it would look like is that the banks would evaluate uh, if you take a very large construction project, for example, look at the uh, construction of the football stadium uh, in Qatar in connection with the upcoming World Cup soccer tournament. Uh, if you believe that there is traffic labor in the construction supply chains, why hasn't the very sophisticated credit analysis that all the big Western banks have gone through when they decided to open up lines of credit in the hundreds of billions of dollars, why hasn't that analysis included a, a, an, an analysis about whether the construction crews have trafficked labor? If the analysis expands to that, you can get uh, representations and warranties and covenants in your credit facilities so that you can address this problem. Uh, and if the borrowers don't address it, they will be denied credit. Super. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentlelady's time has expired. The uh... We, we move on to uh, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Gonzalez, recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Himes and Ranking Member Hill for holding this important and timely hearing. Uh, thank you to our, our panel of witnesses. Uh, it's been um, incredibly important to, to hear your testimonies uh, and your insights into this critical issue. Uh, online child exploitation is one of the worst issues facing our society. Last year, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children received more than 21.7 million reports of child exploitation that represented a 28% increase over 2019 uh, as, as folks have been stuck inside during this pandemic. Uh, Congress must pay increased attention uh, and provide the requisite funding, uh, but also make the appropriate changes to the law. Um, Ms. On that note, Ms. McElwain, I want to start with you and pick up uh, where Mr. Torres may be left off on, on the immortalization component. Um, I think, frankly, the suggestions that you made in your testimony are common sense. I, I, I look forward to working with anybody who uh, wants to work on this to, to make sure that we get these implemented. I can't see why we would not want reliable age and consent verification procedures uh, for any image of a sex act uploaded online. Uh, but on, on the immortalization piece, um, what recourse do victims, if any, what recourse do victims have to get the content taken down? Are they able to use the tools of the law to get it taken down or how, how would they go about doing that? Well, you know, this is a huge, huge problem because even when they are able to get this content taken down, what we find again and again is that it gets re-uploaded again and again and again. And so these victims live in a state of 
you know, kind of obsession with trying to find their abuse material online. Um, you know, they live with the fear that, you know, they can't even go out sometimes to the grocery store or apply for a job. They believe that somebody has seen their videos of their exploitation and abuse. Um, often it causes them to be suicidal, to have suicidal tendencies and thoughts, uh, severe depression, all these things. And so, you know, once this video, this, these videos get online, these images, it's almost impossible to guarantee that they won't be uploaded again. Um, you know, there are some measures that are implemented on these sites for victims to be able to remove content, but often they're ignored. You know, we have many cases in the case of, for example, Pornhub. Can and I replay, I'm sorry, Ms. Sure. Mithway, just for a second. I, I saw uh, Dr. Hatcher nodding her head. I just want to okay. bring her into the conversation. Does that resonate with, with you, the, uh, the story that Ms. McCoy was just, just telling? Absolutely. I just you know, agree with everything that she's saying. I mean, it, and it, it, it causes extreme re-traumatization and it's like, a, it's like becomes their job to try to find where their images are, where these videos are. And, you know, and that, that constant ang angst and anxiety at has someone seen this? And in a lot of cases they have. And so it, it's, you know, it, it's a constant sense of re-traumatization. Thank you for that. Um, Mr. Koch, I want to switch to you. Uh, one, of, one of the biggest barriers to effective tracking and money involved in human trafficking is the widespread use of aging technology by banks uh, as they monitor transaction for signs of money laundering. Uh, as you may know, banks are required by law to monitor the activity. Uh, most monitoring systems are rules-based, so programmed with an if-then scenario, uh, so that if certain things occur, then transactions will be flagged. Uh, today, it strikes me we could and probably should be using AI-based technology like machine learning uh, to recognize suspicious patterns. Uh, one, do you agree with my assessment? But then two, uh, what would need to happen to convert the industry to more high-tech tools? Well, first of all, yes, I agree with your assessment. Uh, although the industry has come uh, a, a, a great um, the industry has progressed quite a lot in the last few years from the traditional rules-based. Uh, many of the large banks uh, are using machine learning and AI. Uh, the smaller banks and the credit unions are not, uh, and those are uh, serious vulnerabilities. Um, and there are ways to address those as well with some of the public-private partnerships. Um, but absolutely, your fundamental point about using technology uh, is critical, but I would add something to that. I won't say but, I'll say and, I would add something to that. In addition to machine learning and AI, in addition to the rules-based, there is the typologies-based, and that comes from information sharing between law enforcement and the private sector. When you do a, a post-mortem after you bring down a trafficking ring and you understand how they access the system, how they move their money, uh, how they stole identities and the like, um, you can develop automated rules that are based on those typologies um, to prevent and detect uh, those um, instances from happening again. So I would do all three. Thank you, and I yield back. The uh, gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Garcia, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Hines and Ranking Member Hill for holding this important hearing and the thanks to our witnesses for joining us today, uh, especially uh, Reverend Hatcher, who hails from Cook County here in the Chicagoland area. Uh, I arrived in this country from Mexico when I was a child. My father came to work under the Bracero program, a government program that brought Mexican workers to the U.S. Since then, I've seen our global economy change and I've seen the evolution of legal and illegal ways to supply labor to employers. And I've seen that human rights and labor rights always go together. It's almost impossible for someone with no labor rights to speak up about trafficking. And it's hard for a person without status to speak up about labor exploitation. So I want to direct my first question to Ambassador DeBaca. When some people hear about the horrors of human trafficking, their first instinct is to close the borders and shut off immigration. Does that make sense to you or does criminalizing immigration just make trafficked workers more vulnerable to corrupt employers and traffickers? 
You know, I think what we've seen, uh, Mr. Garcia, is uh, exactly, uh, I think, what you're noticing, uh, which is that the more securitized a border is, uh, the more there becomes a need to go to the gray economy and find facilitators and smugglers uh, to get into that country. Um, and without having uh, sane and sensible uh, guest worker programs with protections, without having family unification, without having uh, alternative means of, of immigration. Um, it's not simply that the people will come. We shouldn't put this on the workers. It's that the farmers want the work. The um, people who own the companies want the workers. Um, it was, uh, frankly, it was the North Carolina um, agriculture uh, community that pushed for an African guest worker program uh, before the Civil War because they uh, thought that it would bring down the price of slaves. Um, it was uh, the folks who were building the railroads who pushed to bring in Chinese folks uh, who they later excluded. So I think that we need to look at it not simply as a, an issue of the uh, foreign worker who wants to come to the United States and get a job, but thinking about uh, how the American employers can actually get the folks that they need to do the work. Uh, there's plenty of people who are more than willing uh, to come here and contribute and do that work. Thank you for uh, sharing that uh, insight. Um, Ambassador, in your testimony, you mentioned the construction industry and how we need to hold traffickers accountable, not only at the work site, but for the financing and insurance of construction projects as well. Do you think there's a way that workers and labor organizations like trade unions or worker centers, uh, how they could be helpful in ident identifying exploitation and holding these groups higher up the chain accountable? Yes, sir. We certainly saw that uh, in uh, agriculture with the coalition of Immokalee workers uh, who started out in tomatoes uh, and uh, pickles and uh, I think oranges, um, many of whom were survivors of a notorious uh, crew leader in the 1990s uh, in his slavery ring. Uh, but what we've seen is uh, a uh, worker center and a, a uh, construction union in the Twin Cities in Minneapolis uh, who've taken that approach, the Immokalee approach, uh, and uh, started to work uh, to clean up the construction uh, sites uh, and the construction industry there in Minnesota. Uh, and I think that when we actually uh, bring together uh, the worker power, we can uh, set a lot of standards that then good employers can uh, look to as far as how they govern their supply chains and their work sites. Thank you uh, very much. And again, I appreciate uh, all of the uh, fantastic uh, witnesses uh, for shedding light on uh, exploitation and trafficking of humans. Thank you so much. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Taylor, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Hives, appreciate this. And uh, Ranking Member Hill, I just wanted to uh, echo your encouragement for, uh, if not in-person hearings, uh, hybrid hearings. I know we safely did those last year and hope they would come back. I think it really uh, facilitates our ability to interact with each other uh, in person. Uh, and I'll just further echo uh, uh, Ranking Member Hill's comments uh, about uh, the crisis on our southern border. Uh, a few days ago, I was uh, at an emergency intake site uh, in Dallas, Texas, uh, where uh, a facility that had zero, didn't have, didn't even have a signed lease last week, uh, hit capacity at 2,300 uh, children uh, as a result of, of, of what officials there called the, the greatest crisis they've ever seen. Uh, and it is, it is very worrisome, and I know that it's going to result, unfortunately, uh, in more human trafficking as a result of just not having the personnel to secure our border. Um, shifting over to this topic, I wanted to build on my colleague, Representative Dean's questions uh, about the, the helping survivors to take the next step. Uh, something I worked on when I was in the Texas legislature was legislation to help victims of human trafficking to be able to seal their records, uh, many of them while they were trafficked. Uh, had uh, been convicted of crimes uh, while they were while they were being trafficked, and those criminal convictions would preclude them from really living full and productive lives. And uh, Doctor, I was going to ask you and your did, did, 
if you if I may be so bold as to ask you, I mean, did you did you in, uh, incur a conviction while you were being trafficked, or did you know others that have gone through that? Yes. So that is my story. Thank you uh, for asking that question. Um, I was uh, arrested and I was actually sent to, uh, my trafficker sent me out to get drugs, uh, to bring back to where the sex acts took place for, you know, enormous amounts of time. All it was, was the selling of sex and the uh, use of drugs uh, you know, was 24 seven. And so I was sent out to do so. I was arrested. Uh, my conviction uh, that, you know, I mentioned that I received executive clemency from uh, then Governor Rauner was indeed a drug, uh, it was a conviction for drugs. Um, and the, but the application for clemency was built on the fact that I was a trafficking victim and that I was, under the you know, under duress and sent out to, to do the bidding, which is the typical story, sir, which is the typical story. We are the ones who end up with the convictions and the difficulties in getting back into mainstream society. Sure, well, I know that in Texas, we were able to pass laws to help victims like yourself who were convicted of crimes while they're being trafficked to be able to seal their criminal records. Do, do they have a similar law for the crimes uh, that you were convicted of in the state of Illinois? Well, the thing, the reason why uh, my only recourse was to receive executive clemency and expungement by the governor of Illinois was because in Illinois, the, the law is more narrow. And uh, in Illinois, there is a, a law, if the convictions had been for human, you know, related to prostitution or human trafficking, I would have been able to get um, the, everything would have been able to uh, vacate it. But sure. because it was a drug charge, Drug charge was not in that, so there's Got certain uh, core occurring crimes that did not qualify. Yeah, and, and I will say I was very surprised when I came to Congress and reviewed. Uh, there is no ceiling law in federal statute today, uh, and uh, you know a a sentence to a federal penitentiary should not be a life sentence. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think if we want to help people get their lives back, we need to work on that. I actually uh, signed on as the uh, original. Uh, lead with my colleague from New York, Hakeem Jeffries, on a piece of legislation to expand the very narrow, we have a very narrow piece of, of expunction, but I'm also working with him on this ceiling law to try to help uh, people who have been convicted of a crime, who served their crime, served their time, to be able to seal their records so that they could take that next positive step in their life, the way that you have. Uh, I think you really exemplify. Well, they could seal them. Uh, yeah, I should say, sir, excuse me for interrupting. They could <laughs> seal them, but in terms of... Okay making it go away right that yeah yeah but un but understand under federal law there is no ceiling provision today none uh that's and so it would make yeah. sense to me to take the lessons that we've learned uh in right on crime at the state level and apply them to the federal level and really give so many millions of americans their chance to get their lives back mr chairman i yield back Gentlemen, time has expired. I recognize the chairwoman of the House Committee on Financial Services, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, for five minutes. Thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I uh, am so pleased you're holding this hearing. And this is a subject that has been talked about and talked about and talked about. And I think now what you're doing is providing the leadership for us to really do something about it. I'd like to address... Um, my question to Reverend Dr. Hatcher and Mr. Koch. Uh, you have worked directly with survivors and with efforts to support survivors. Without proactive engagement, it can be difficult for survivors whose credit and identities have been misappropriated and damaged to secure employment or shelter. Lacking identification, such as birth certificates or driver's license, they face hurdles in accessing uh, the banking system and navigating services to access benefits and restore identities. Can you illustrate how the financial services industry can help and how nonprofit services, law enforcement and government can take action to support survivors so they may escape this nightmarish cycle of abuse? First of all, it's an honor, Congresswoman uh, Waters. I'm a great fan of yours. Um, so. I'll give you an example. What happened when I was uh, in my exploitation, um, 
one of the traffickers involved in uh, in in my orbit what got me to sign for a car because before my trafficking experience, I had A1 credit. And so, you know, they had me sign for a car. I'm still really, I still have that on my, even though it's years ago and I've worked around it, it is still something that they call me for. Uh, and of course there's interest, but that, that in itself was, there was fear. First of all, survivors have a hard time making it back because of, uh, I had financial literacy uh, in my previous life, but after exploitation, I didn't even, I was scared. And so I did not um, have the ability at that time to, you know, run, get my credit report run um, out of fear. I knew how to do it, but most survivors, you know, many do not ever have a, uh, a credit report run, know what they need to do to rebuild their credit or obtain for the first time a credit. Uh, um, it took me time to get my bank account situation back because uh, I was scared to even try to do that again. And so there needs to be financial literacy. There needs to be financial coaching for survivors so that whatever point uh, they need to you know, start doing this to, to get that financial uh, foundation, um, they need support, they need help, and they need someone that's going to help them navigate the system, the financial systems to get their lives back. The other thing though, uh, I would say uh, not only that is to deal with the the fact that, you know, in therapy that this was not your fault. There is so much guilt associated with, uh, you know, you look really bad when you've got bad credit. It just, most people think I'm bad. But when you, when you look at it as somebody, you know, is not going to give me that chance, they're not going to give me any of the chances along any lines. And now I can't even get a bank account or a credit card. Wow. What a nightmare. Mr. Cox. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. It's nice to meet you. Thank you. So the, the, the Lichtenstein initiative, uh, that I participated in, uh, and it is still very active. This is a public-private partnership co-sponsored by the governments of Australia, the Netherlands, and Liechtenstein, uh, and co-convened by uh, Mohammed Yunus, the Nobel Peace Prize winner for microcredit. Uh, we created uh, what we call the Survivor Inclusion Initiative. Uh, we recognized uh, very early on that survivors, if they are uh, lucky enough to escape their traffickers uh, often learn that their identities have been hijacked and that can make it impossible to open a bank account. Uh, their credit histories have been ruined and it can be difficult to get a job, difficult to get an apartment. And of course, all of that makes them more vulnerable to re-victimization. So we created the Survivor Inclusion Initiative. Uh, I brought together 12 global banks uh, and in partnership with Polaris, who brought together uh, some of the larger victim service providers in the country, we created a mechanism to open simple checking and savings accounts for confirmed survivors. Uh, and uh, it's really very gratifying to be able to report to you that uh, in about a year's time, we have opened uh, approximately 2,000 bank accounts wow. uh, in the UK, uh, North America, uh, and uh, yeah, the UK, Canada, and the US, uh, and that program continues. Since I'm out of time, I'll mention very quickly uh, that the suggestion uh, that you mentioned about credit repair and financial literacy is a concrete area where uh, a lot of stakeholders can make a contribution. Um, there is an opportunity for uh, credit repair legislation uh, and financial literacy programs. We're working on those as well and be happy to speak to the staff uh, to continue that discussion. Thank you so very much. I appreciate all that you have done and the leadership you have provided. And there's hope uh, giving the kind of information that you share with us for us to be able to do something about it. And with Mr. Himes, uh, in charge, we're going to get something done. Thank you very much. The uh, chairwoman yields back. The uh, gentlewoman from Missouri, Ms. Uh, Wagner, is recognized for five minutes. I want to thank uh, Chairman Himes and Ranking Member uh, French Hill for for allowing me to uh, to speak at this hearing. I'm I'm uh, subcommittee crashing at the moment, but I'm I'm grateful um, because I for allowing me to discuss an issue that I'm so passionate about. And 
and talk about the bad actors that can can profit and evade detection through the financial services industry. Um, I was so proud when Congress passed my Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act, FOSTA, uh, with the help of many of our witnesses and so many on this committee also of, of, on a bipartisan basis. Uh, I can I can say that FOSTA was also, you know, we led the only successful effort to amend uh, the increasingly controversial Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act uh, in the history of, of 230 uh, since 1996. And FOSTA really helps expose and hold accountable websites that profit from modern day sex slavery. Uh, the financial services industry plays a pivotal role in combating trafficking and these stakeholders must ensure that their products are not being used to purchase child sexual abuse and sex trafficking material. I have worked at length with credit card companies to help them uh, better scrutinize their payment processing and following the tireless campaign of Trafficking Hub and Lila uh, Micklewaite, uh, which precipitated a scathing report from the New York Times in December on the massive amount of rape and child sexual abuse materials on Pornhub, as was previously stated in her testimony, Visa, MasterCard, and Discover announced that they would no longer process payments to the website. And just days later, Pornhub removed up to three-fourths of its library, totaling roughly 10 million videos. This is a good first step, but more must and can be done. The coronavirus pandemic has exacerbated the problem of online enticement to an unprecedented degree. And um, Lila, from, who hails from my home state of Missouri, has done tremendous work to expose other websites like OnlyFans that promote child sexual abuse. But credit card companies still service only fans, and the site uses mainstream, low-risk merchant category codes, merchant category codes, despite charging customers for explicit content that preys on our children. I hope that by shedding light on these bad, bad actors today, that financial services companies will choose to better scrutinize these sites. I'm also thrilled to welcome Marion Hatcher um, as a witness today. Marion was indispensable to my team uh, as we worked to get FOSTA over the finish line, and she is truly one of the nation's preeminent public servants. Ms. Micklewake, given your experience with Pornhub and MindGeek, how can financial services companies take proactive steps to ensure that their services are not being used to purchase child sexual abuse material online? Yeah, well, thank you for that question, and thank you for your work, um, Mrs. Wagner. I've, uh, you know, really appreciated as an activist um, your passion and dedication to fighting sex trafficking specifically. Um, so thank you, thank you for that. Um, you know, and I, I hate to sound like a broken record. <laughs> Often I feel like I am, but these companies, you know, when you're talking about sex trafficking, when we're talking about sex acts that are being uploaded online, we need accountability and oversight to the nature of those sex acts. And so credit card companies should not be allowing their services to enable transactions if these companies are not verifying that these are not children who are being trafficked and raped for yep. profit on their site and that these are, you know, and consent and agreement that these are not women who are being assaulted, who are being drugged and raped, who and, are being trafficked could, for profit as well. And, and if I could, Ms. Bickleway, because I'm running out of time here, sure. um, how does the mislabeling of merchant category codes, such as this case with OnlyFans, make it more difficult for financial services companies to monitor potential human trafficking and child sexual abuse? Yeah, well, unfortunately, my uh, expertise uh, really uh, is focused on on the big porn sites like uh, uh, MindGeek sites, and I'm not familiar with those merchant category codes. So unfortunately, uh, you know, that's not a question I would be able to well, appropriately answer. Well, my time has expired. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you. This is this is so so very important and um I'd, I'd like to submit the rest of my questions uh for the record and and also i'd like us to really look into these merchant category codes and bring it to light um through our 
Financial Services Committee and through your subcommittee. So again, thank you for uh, indulging me and, um, and, and for convening this really important uh, hearing. I'm grateful. The gentlelady's time has expired and um, I'd like to thank our witnesses for their testimony. Uh, very powerful, very useful, very pragmatic and constructive testimony today. Uh, I, I think I speak for all of my colleagues when I say we're, we're grateful for the opportunity to, to discuss in a bipartisan way how we can uh, address one of the uh, uglier aspects of our, of our society. Um, without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able. And without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. I remind members that written questions and materials for the record should be submitted to FSC documents at mail.house. Dot co dot gov. With that, I thank the members and I particularly thank the witnesses and this hearing is adjourned.